Let's open our Bibles this morning to first or Second Thessalonians chapter two. And let's stand together. We're going to read God's word. And we want to look at Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses five through the end of the chapter. Paul is writing, and he says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer punishment, the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. When He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every good work by work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may be seated. I always like to sort of cite sources that were extremely valuable. Uh, I've always appreciated the ministry of uh, Dr. John MacArthur. Um, The man is just like, God has blessed him with great insight into Scripture and um, was very helpful for putting this very important sermon together uh, this morning as we talk about the apocalypse, the apocalypse. Now, with the light of things that are taking place in our world today, um, one of the one of the words that you often hear used is, is this the apocalypse or is the apocalypse coming? Now, in the secular world, when you hear the word apocalypse, there's there's one sort of idea that comes to people's mind. Now, now you notice I said secular world. This is not the spiritual world that has an understanding of scripture. This is the secular world as it has viewed scripture and made sort of some basic observations and comments. So when you hear it in the secular world, um, when you hear the word apocalypse, what comes to your mind? In the secular world, the apocalypse is synonymous with what? The end of the world, isn't it? When people talk about apocalypse, they, they are talking about cataclysmic events leading up to the destruction of the world. That's what they think about. It is usually involves an Armageddon some kind of event where all the nations of the world come together for World War III, the final world war, and it results in mass destruction and carnage all over the place. That's apocalypse. And whenever there's upheaval and terrorism and the world is on edge, which it is today, people start thinking, is this the beginning of the end, right? Is this the apocalypse? Well, as we turn our Bibles this morning to 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, Paul says to the Thessalonians how the Lord will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. You notice that? The Lord will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, the word revealed in that passage, okay? The word revealed is translated in the Greek from the word apocalypsis. Okay? Apocalypsis. So that's where that that whole idea of apocalypse comes from that Greek word. It literally describes the unveiling of something that's been previously hidden. Right? Something that's been covered. Okay? So an apocalypse is the removing of something that's been veiled, something that's been covered, or something that hasn't been clearly recognized or seen. So, what has been veiled 
that is about or will be unveiled. What has been covered or not seen clearly that in a certain time in human history will be revealed. Paul is speaking about the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Now, when Paul speaks about the coming of the Lord Jesus, he does in two senses. Okay, He speaks about the revelation of Christ and the coming of Christ, which are two specific ideas that are addressed to two specific sort of groups of people. The revelation and the coming. In verse 10, you notice, Paul speaks about the fact that Christ is coming. Christ is coming to be glorified in his saints. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is primarily related to believers, believers in Jesus Christ. It's a common term that Paul uses throughout his writing. It's a Greek word called parousia, and it means the arrival or the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the arrival of one whom we know, who believers know, they're acquainted with. It is the presence of the one that we have come into a personal relationship by faith that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, right? So we have a relationship with Jesus, and there's a sense to which Jesus Christ is not hidden or veiled to us. In other words, if you're a believer, when Jesus returns for you, you're going to know it's Jesus. You're going to know it because you have read the Word, you've read the Bible, you have understood it, it's been illuminated to you by the Holy Spirit, and you've come to understand who Jesus Christ is, you've embraced that by faith, and when Jesus returns, you'll know him. You won't be surprised, because you have come to know him in life. Uh, the scriptures tell us, Paul says, this, I believe it's in First, First Timothy, even though we have not seen him, we know him. And he even though we have not seen him now, we love him, right? And with the eye of faith and with the Holy Spirit making Jesus Christ real to us, we know him, right? And so we know him because of everything that's taught to us in the Scripture. So there's a sense that when we look on the return of Christ, it is Jesus coming for us. That's what we hope for. That's what we're longing for. That's the next thing that's about to happen or that will happen that the Bible says will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's something that we are to, to live every day preparing for, being ready for, anticipating, longing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a revelation or an unveiling or an apocalypse for unbelievers. That's also described in this passage. An apocalypse for unbelievers. It's an unveiling that is the appearing of someone who is not known. Someone whose identity and the reality of their person is, is hidden from them. Okay? It's hidden from them. So, so when Paul chooses the word apocalypsis or unveiling, he has in mind primarily the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to a world that does not know him. That's what he's talking about. A, a world that does not know him. A world that does not see him. A world that does, does not perceive the reality of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's basically, they basically live their life oblivious to Jesus Christ. I mean, they know the, the, they know the name Jesus Christ because the world speaks often very fluently of Jesus Christ. The only problem is, it's usually when they're swearing at someone. It's not that they don't know of Jesus Christ. They just don't know him. They don't know him as God. They don't know him as Redeemer and Savior. They know about a Jesus Christ. They know that religious people, and uh, they could even be religious themselves, um, um, talk about Jesus, but they don't really know Jesus as he is, has revealed himself in the, the Bible, in the Scriptures. And so Paul chooses this unveiling 
to say that the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming is going to be made visible. The one who's been hidden, who's been out of sight, who's been seated at the right hand of God will come out in the open. One who has lived in secret is going to be made public for all the world to see. And when Jesus comes a second time, he will come in full, unveiled, divine glory. Right? He will come as a sovereign king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, to rule on the earth. Now, the first time that Jesus came, the reality of who he was was very much hidden. In fact, in John chapter 1, it says he came to the world, but the world knew him not. The world didn't know him. And you know what? In a large segment of the population today, the world still doesn't know Jesus Christ. But the second time he comes, it's not going to be hidden. He will be revealed, and the world will see him. Every eye will see him, and everyone, when they see him, they will know exactly who this is. The first time Christ came, the fullness of his person was hidden. The next time he comes, it won't be. Every eye will see him. Every eye will behold him. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. The next time he comes, there won't be a Bethlehem. There won't be a stable. There won't be a manger. There will be no poverty, no dusty roads to walk, no sinners to attack him or grieve him, no false leaders to harass him every step that he makes, no demons to, to, to deal with challenging his steps, no soldiers to pound nails in his hands or to thrust spears in his side. There will be no cross when he's revealed the world when he's unveiled for the world to see, the next time he comes, it's going to be an unveiling, an apocalypse. Christ will not come in human form alone, but he will be the glorified God-man revealed from heaven in flaming fire with all of his angels, coming to assert his rightful rule over all creation over all that live on this planet. That's the unveiling. Notice further description of the apocalypse. Christ comes, Paul says, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. You see that? Three descriptive terms. Why does he say that? What's significant that Christ is coming from heaven with him, his mighty angels in flaming fire. Well, Paul is saying this here to tell us that in every sense, Jesus' coming is coming as God. He is God. He is God the Son returning. He comes from heaven where God dwells. He comes with the mighty angels who are the ministering servants of God. And he comes in flaming fire to display the radiance of the glory of God. Christians live in the light of this great reality. That's our shining hope. That's our source of encouragement that Jesus is coming again. He's coming in the splendor and glory of his heavenly power, robed in the mighty splendor and glory of his divine radiance for all to see. That's what we look forward to. And Paul is saying this to the Thessalonians. In the face of all your hardships, in the face of all the adversity and persecution that you're going to and that you're facing in life, look to this great event and be encouraged. Be encouraged. Jesus is coming in indescribable power. He's coming in unbelievable, mystifying glory with his angels and everyone's going to see him at his unveiling. Folks, this is not mere speculation. This is not wishful thinking. This is not a fantasy made up in the imagination uh, uh, of the mind of a man. This is pre-written history. It's written in many places throughout the Scripture, confirmed by many uh, who wrote the Scriptures. 
all testifying to the same event. Now, notice this apocalypse, this apocalyptic or in unveiling event will produce two very specific results. Two results that are quite different. And they're all outlined in this chapter in the verses that I just read. Verse 6, it's only just for God to repay, it says. You notice that? Verse 7, and to give relief. That's another thing. Verse 8, dealing out retribution. That's one thing. To be glorified in his saints. That's another thing. So we see two specific things happen with the apocalypse, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you notice in your bulletin today, we have a little outline. The unveiling brings relief, first of all, to those persevering followers of Jesus Christ. It's relief to them. They worship to be glorified in his saints. They marvel. They rejoice when he comes. They're excited to see Jesus. And I hope you're excited to see Jesus. I hope you're not so attached to this world that Jesus couldn't pull you out of here and that you wouldn't be excited if he showed up for you. Right? That's one response. So that's what one unveiling brings. Relief. Relief. But you notice in the passage, it's, it's a much more somber tone. It's not an exciting thing. Actually, actually, it's something that, that ought to concern every one of us right now where we sit today because the unveiling brings retribution. Retribution. You see that word? Retribution. To, to some people, it says, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. That's the unveiling. So this whole passage... Verses 6 through 10 center around two specific or two separate acts. And if you look in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, John was receiving a vision from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter 10 of Revelation, John was given a little book. He was handed that book. And oddly in this vision, in this revelation, John was told to eat this book. Now, this book was about God's judgment, God judging the world, right? And as John eats the book, according to the, what he was commanded to do, he described how it tasted. As he ate the book, the book tasted sweet and it tasted bitter. Two separate tastes in eating the book. It was sweet because when Jesus comes and sets up his glorious kingdom, that brings relief to the saints, brings relief to Christians. It brings relief to the followers of Jesus. But it's bitter in its taste. Because when Jesus comes, it is retribution to those who are ungodly and those who reject the gospel. It's, it's bitter because it is retribution. And so the second coming of Christ brings two responses from Christians. It's relief for them. For unbelievers, it's something to dread because it is a just God bringing retribution, it says. Right? Retribution. Now, true disciples of Jesus understand the relief part of this, right? Notice in verse 7, to give relief. That word relief is the Greek word that has the idea of being free from tension. Free from tension. We all know what it's like to be tense, right? There's a lot of tension in this world. You might be tense today over stuff that you're facing in life that you wish you didn't have to deal with. There's tension, right? Tension. But the word relief means, in the sense to be free from tension, to be absent from trial or adversity. It means to let up, right? And I was excited on Friday afternoon when the snow finally let up because it was creating tension for me. 
of how I was going to get rid of all that snow out of my driveway, right? Because it kept piling up and piling up and piling up. And when I was young, like a lot of you guys out here and strong, shoveling snow was just, ah, take it on, yeah, right? As you get older and your back starts to tell you you're not as strong as you used to be, um, snow can bring some tension because it's like, how do I get rid of this, right? My son is here today, but he's not here to help me anymore. Shovel snow. I'd like for him to be here, tell me shovel snow, but, but I don't. And so that, there's the idea there, bringing relief from something that creates tension. Or if a Greek person was using this particular word, um, they, would, they would describe, or you know, if, if he was an archer and he bent his bow just enough to take the string off, he would be relieving the tension, right? Because when you, when you set up the bow, it's under tension, right? The string is under tension. And so Christ is coming to bring relief. He's taking the tension out of life. He's taking death and making that final. We don't have to worry about it anymore. When Christ comes, it's relief because death is done away with. When Christ comes, it's going to be relief because sin is no longer uh, something we have to deal with anymore in our lives. Sorrow will be gone. No more conflicts when Christ returns. Isn't that going to be relief? No more conflicts. No more rejections. No one to reject you anymore in life. No more pain. No more knee surgeries. No more hips that, that... Feel it when the weather comes or whatever else. No, no more pain, right? No suffering, no disease, no terrorist bombings. Relief. The pressure and the tension will be relaxed. And, and the people of God, the followers of Jesus Christ, the saints, will enjoy eternal joy and rest and relief. That's something to look forward to. That's something to be excited about. That's something to be encouraged about. Relief is coming. Relief is on the way when Jesus returns. But you notice in the passage, there is something else that is talked about and promised that comes with the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And that is the word retribution. Retribution. Kind of a big word. And while Paul is telling the Thessalonians to endure and to per, per, persevere and to wait for relief. He just doesn't give that side of the story. He feels obligated to give the other side of the story, to tell the whole side of the story. Because when Christ comes, there's another experience. It's not just relief. It is retribution. And this isn't a pleasant experience. This isn't even a pleasant thing to talk about. But it's important to talk about it. Because I'm not 100% sure that everyone in this room is free from experiencing God's divine retribution. So I want to tell you about it and to tell you how you can be free from it. If that's the case, notice. Paul says, God is going to repay, verse 6. And then, verse 8, he says... Dealing out rep retribution. And then in verse 9, he says, they will pay the penalty. So what's retribution about? It is giving people what they justly deserve. And I emphasize the word justly. It's, it's justice, okay? The word retribution is a big word. You know what it means. It means to pay somebody back, right? Right? It's to pay somebody back. That's retribution. They often talk about it in sports, you know. A team gets beat, and they avenge the loss. They get retribution in a later game, you know, by winning. So they could say that about the Yankton Bucks, who won the state AA football championship. They lost to Pierre early in the season. They got retribution in the Dakota Dome when they won, right? It was payback, right? Vindicating something that has taken place early. In this case, um, as Paul is talking about, vindicating those who have suffered unjustly. 
in this life who've suffered injustice, and we've all suffered injustice. God's going to make every injustice you ever face in this life, God makes it right because he's completely just, right? And to punish. So that's exactly what's going to happen when Jesus comes. Divine retribution means to settle the score, to vindicate those who suffered unjustly, and to punish those who were involved in this. God's going to exercise pure, righteous justice. Now, Paul isn't inventing this. This isn't the first time that judgment or retribution is even mentioned in Scripture, uh, or it's not even the first time that um, in Scripture that there's been sort of this identification of a twofold coming why Jesus is returning. In fact, Jesus himself talked about a twofold return. What would happen when he returned? And what would happen to certain people and other people? And you notice that, and I think I have this scripture up there, Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. This is the parable that Jesus ta- told about the wheat and the tares. The, the wheat is, is the fruitful Christian that's accepted the gospel and is growing. And in the midst of that wheat are unbelievers, the tares. And you notice the parable, he says, don't pull them out. Right? And you notice as you go through the parable, and as Jesus is explaining it to his disciples, right? He says, just as the weeds are gathered, that's what we do with weeds, right? We gather them up, and they're burned in the fire because because they're just a nuisance. They, They destroy things. They keep things from growing, right? Weeds are horrible things. If you've ever tried to plant something, and the weeds get in there, They begin to suck the nutrients out of the life of those things that are actually growing and productive. The weeds are gathered and burned with a fire. So it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out his kingdom, gather out of his kingdom, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into a fiery furnace. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, it's amazing how people in the world think Jesus said all, everything when they talk about Jesus, Jesus always said pleasant, lovely things, right? Jesus said always nice things that everybody could just resonate. Um, I, uh, I would find, if you read that again, and you read it really clearly, that is very unpleasant. Because in that passage, Jesus is defining something. He is saying there's going to be retribution. He's going to say the angels are going to come and collect the ungodly and cast them into hell. Which says there is a hell. Right from Jesus' own mouth. And you say, why would Jesus come back to do this? Why would he do that? Why would he come back for that purpose? Verse 8, to deal out retribution, vengeance, punishment. Why would he come and do that? To pay people back the penalty. I mean, on the surface, that seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? Well, verse 6 gives us the answer. For after all, it is only just for God to repay. It is only just for God to repay. It's a matter of justice. That's why God's the only one that's just. It's proper administration of God's justice. It's only the right punishment to be exercised on those who have violated God's law. This is what happens, retribution. And we understand justice to some extent, even though we don't always see it happening in our society. It can upset us and disturb us when we see things happen, when people get off for crimes committed and that innocent people have to suffer. That bothers us. Why does that, utter, why does that bother you? Why does it bother me? We understand that there's a right punishment for criminals. It's just for God to repay. Why? Because we've been created in God's image and likeness. 
And be, in that image, there's a sense of justice. There's a sense of fairness. There's a sense of right and wrong. There's a sense that, that those who do wrong need to face something for that. For the vindication of those who've suffered because of their wrongness. And even the word retribution, when you look at how it's put together in its structure, uh, means that which is just or right. And really, folks, this is not something where God is coming, the Lord Jesus is coming, to be very vindictive on people. He, he, he's not coming to get even with people. There's not some level of frustration right now that's building up in heaven that reaches its boiling point, because sometimes that's the way Christians explain it. Oh, wow, God's put up with a lot. Now it's time, you know? It's not like that. It's not like God is just really excited to come down, bring retribution, because he's vindictive, because he has some measure of rage to get even with people. Because we know that's not God's character. The Bible says God is a God of love. God loves people, but he's God that is also just. He's fair. So God is simply giving just repayment and punishment because he's perfectly righteous and just to do it on those who by their own will and their own decision have broken his law. They've just decided to do that. They've decided, I don't, I don't care about Jesus. I'm just going to rebel against that. That's, that's just this fanatical sort of uh, untrue religious garbage that people believe because they need some, a crutch to, to go on in life. And there's many people like that. And that's their willful decision. Right? That's what they decide. Right? I don't care about God's law. I don't care what it says about sex or marriage. I don't, say, I don't care what God's law really teaches about me. I'm not under that. Right? Plenty of people like that. I'll, I'll violate it because I don't... I, where is there a God? This is just all made up stuff by man. Plenty of people like that. But folks, as you read God's word and you see that he's just, you know that he can't be unjust. God will do what is just. But the unbelieving world doesn't want to admit that. They don't want to admit that they are subject to the justice of God. People don't want to admit that. Even the Israelites did. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 17, it says, Yet your fellow citizens say, the way of the Lord is not just. So here's the Israelites saying, oh, God is not just. They want to accuse God of being unjust when it is their own way that is unrighteous and unjust. So God's vengeance, really based in Christ, is based on a principle. It's a spiritual law that's bound up in the perfect character and holy nature of God. God has to repay. He has to because he's just. He's fair. It's only just for God to repay, to give back. Right? Divine judgment is reasonable. It makes sense. It's just. It's fair. Whatever a man sows, what? That's what he reaps. Right? It's a universal law. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I'll give back to you what you gave to me. If you gave me faith and belief and trust, I'll give you eternal salvation. If you gave me rebellion, resistance, there will be a reward for that. It's called retribution. One is relief and the other is retribution. So who receives divine retribution? Verse 6, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. You see that? So... Those who afflict you, those who persecute you, really says God will bring retribution 
and just vengeance upon those who touch his people. You see, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God and you belong to God. You've been bought with a price. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And if someone touches you, For evil, God will bring vengeance, whether it's affliction of persecution and even death, because you belong to Jesus Christ and you are his possession. And if someone touches you, the Bible says here, God will repay them for touching. But you notice in this fray, in this passage, there are there's a there's a larger group that this extends to, not just those who have persecuted or afflicted Christians. Notice, first of all, the retribution comes to those who do not know God. Those who do not know God. That means they have no personal relationship with God. See, when you come to Discovery Church, you'll hear the pastor say many times, do you have a personal relationship with God? And the reason we say that is because religion that's very prevalent in our world doesn't teach that. They don't teach a relationship with God. They teach religious rules and duties and works that people do hoping somehow to please God. We don't talk about that. We talk about how the God of heaven, the God that created and made you, came to this earth so that you could have a relationship with him that's forever. And he did it by supplying a Savior to die for your sins so that you could be accepted in God's sight because there's nothing you could do on your own merits or your own good efforts to accomplish that. So God accomplished it for you in Jesus Christ. And he says, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will have a relationship with me that's eternal. Knowing God is most important. No, knowing about God is what many people do. Just like people know about Jesus, they don't know him personally. Religion teaches you to know about God and to know about Jesus and, and talk about God and talk about Jesus, but it doesn't encourage people to repent of their sins and to believe that Jesus Christ died to save them. It teaches them to try to earn it on your own good merits and work. See, that's a difference. And Jesus' own words in John chapter 17, verse 3, look at this. He says, and this is eternal life. If you want an eternal life, that they may know you, God, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. See, knowing God is the key. And people who do not know God, who don't have a personal relationship with him and Jesus, will go through and experience retribution, right? That's what the Bible teaches, retribution, right? But there's a second definition. So that's the most important thing. Do you know God? Do you know him personally through Jesus Christ? But there's also a second definition, these people who will feel retribution, it's not only the ones who, who do not, who persecute Christians and, and that belong to a larger group of those who do not go, but he adds those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is something else, right? It's something very much more difficult than just not knowing God, it's to, to have heard about God and his salvation through Jesus Christ as the way to eternal life and to reject that, that brings people under greater judgment in their life. You see, the hottest hell and the severest punishment is reserved for those who reject the gospel. You see, there are levels of hell based on what you've experienced in life. And the hottest hell, the darkest, where the, where the, where the pain, 
the agony and the misery is given not to those who have their moral conscience that tells them that there is a God and they suppress that truth that Romans 1 talks us about. It, the hottest hell, a deeper hell, comes to those who sat in a church, heard the gospel, heard about their need for a Savior, and walked out and rejected it. Said, I don't need that. That's what, that's what we see. Those who did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some people reject God even though they've heard more about Him. They've read about Him. They've been exposed to Christianity. They still reject God. There's still all, so there's all kinds of levels of information that people can know God. But the pinnacle of it is when you've heard the gospel, when you've listened to the story of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and you reject that. That is the most intense guilt that brings the severest punishment, the hottest hell, the greatest vengeance. In Hebrews chapter 10, it clearly states it. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the truth about Jesus Christ, that we need to know Him personally by faith, if we receive that knowledge of the truth, but we go on willfully sinning, we reject that truth, there is no longer a sacrifice, remains a sacrifice for sins. If you reject the truth of Jesus Christ, that sacrifice, there is nothing else for you but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment in God's presence. That's what the Bible teaches. All you've got to look forward to is a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of the fire that will consume the adversaries of God in hell. So if you reject Christ, if you reach that ultimate where you've heard the good news, where you've heard how you can be saved, when you've heard how a person is reconciled to God and becomes a friend of God, becomes a child of God, knows God personally, if you reject that message, what it calls you to do in repenting of your sins and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, if you reject Jesus Christ, all you can expect at the apocalypse, when Jesus is unveiled for the world to see, is judgment in hell. That's justice. That's what is right in God's eyes. But you notice, Paul says, because they did not believe, they did not obey the gospel. You notice that he uses the word obey. The gospel is something that we need to obey. The gospel in receiving it is an act of obedience. We obey something. Because the gospel says, it commands us to repent. It calls us to believe, to place our faith in Jesus Christ, which to express faith is an action. To repent is an action. It's an acknowledgement of sin. It's to say the same thing about my sin that God says about it. So those are commands to obey, to repent, to believe. And so Paul says, doesn't he say that in that passage? Retribution comes to those who do not obey the gospel. In other words, they want to try to find another way. Why do you think Cain was rejected? Cain, you remember the brother of Abel who brought his sacrifice to the Lord and God says this is not acceptable because you're not obeying Cain. I asked for something different. And Cain says, no, I want to bring you something that I have made, that I've prepared, that I have worked for, that I have given my life to my sweat and blood to make happen. So God, I want to give you what I want to give you. You need to accept that. And God says, no, that's not acceptable. And many people are walking the way of Cain in life. God has says, obey. This is what I want from you. And you say, no, God, I don't want to give you repentance. I don't want to give you faith. I want to give you something else, something that I've worked really hard for, something that I want to present from my own life of my goodness to you. And God says, you cannot come that way. You will not be accepted that way. You must obey the gospel and what it calls us to do. 
So how do we, how do we escape the apocalypse that results in vengeance on the vengeance of God on those who persecute and do not know God and who reject the gospel? We obey what the gospel calls us to do. We repent. We confess Jesus. We believe. We follow. We surrender our heart and life to Jesus. And when we do, his coming to, again, will be a relief to us and not retribution. When Jesus comes, will his coming be relief to you? Or will it be retribution? Do you know him? Have you obeyed the gospel? Will the apocalypse be a, a welcomed event of relief or will it be a dreaded realization that when I had the opportunity to believe and resisted that, I put my life to be judged by God and rightly judged, I stand to be condemned to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, where there's flames and fire. Why? Because I rejected Jesus Christ and the good news. No one this morning has to leave fearing divine retribution if we're willing to step out in faith and trust Christ to obey the gospel. And I have to say, folks, many people sit in churches today who are just not sure. They're just not sure. They know about God, but have you surrendered your life to God? Have you obeyed? Have you, have you put your faith solely in Jesus Christ? Have you said the same thing about your sin that God says? Yes, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. If that's the case, you can be confident that when Jesus Christ returns, it will be a wonderful day of relief for you. But if you can't, it stands to be a day of retribution where God's justice will be served. And when God's justice is served, if you experience retribution, you will agree with God that he was completely right because he will show you that on November 22nd, 2015, you sat at Discovery Church and you were given the opportunity to believe and you said no. That will be the argument that God will bring against you. You heard you, you were given the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus, to express and to believe and to obey the gospel, and you said, no. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to trust to do this life the way I want to do it. No one has to experience divine retribution if they come to accept Jesus Christ. And I offer that invitation to you this morning as we bow our heads and close our eyes, and as, as this, Rachel plays the song for us this morning, I want, you, I want you, if you do not know Jesus Christ personally, to either, while this song is saying, pray in your heart to repent and acknowledge by faith Jesus Christ, or if you want help doing that, would you come up here? There's no one here to, to shamefully look on you. This is why we are here this morning, to make sure that every person has that confident assurance that they are going to be with Jesus Christ, and when he comes, it's going to be a glorious relief for them and not fearful retribution. Because they've rejected the gospel, they've failed to obey the good news that was offered to them. And so as the song is played this morning, and you have a burden and a concern about your spiritual life, would you come?